Side Hustle Show 209. This is Amazon FBA private label strategies for 2017 with tips from two seven-figure Amazon sellers. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where it's all about ideas, action, and results. Fun episode for you today to close out 2016 with a fan favorite. I'm excited to welcome Andy Slammons back to the show, along with his Amazon FBA partner, Leron Hirschkorn. Now, we first met Andy back in episode 84. So this was late 2014 as he was wrapping up his first year as a full-time Amazon seller and closing in on a $400,000 business in his first year. Now, in that conversation, we took a deep dive into product research and we used onion goggles as an example of a potentially profitable private label product. Now, fast forward a couple years and both Andy and Liron are running seven-figure Amazon private label businesses. Wow, that's just to think about that in in such a short period of time is kind of crazy. Now, of course, the Amazon landscape has changed quite a bit since that first recording. So in this episode, we're going to dive into what's working today in terms of product research, in terms of idea generation, and some other creative tactics to come up with profitable items to sell. And while the marketplace is more competitive, the pie has also gotten bigger with more transactions taking place via e-commerce and Amazon than ever before. So stick around to hear Andy and Liron's product research strategies, the specific criteria they look for before investing in inventory, and the recommendations for gathering your initial sales and reviews. Notes, links, and a free PDF highlight reel from this conversation are at sidehustlenation.com slash Andy. And if you want to take an even deeper dive into this stuff, check out some of the free training videos and resources Andy's put together for Side Hustle Nation at amazingfreedom.com slash hustle, amazingfreedom.com slash hustle. Leron kicks us off with a discussion of the current competitive landscape that new sellers are facing on Amazon. Ready? Let's do it. There's opportunity with Amazon and with e-commerce because there's always going to be innovations for new product opportunities. There's ways to improve on current products. And there are existing listings on Amazon that you can just do much better than. Uh, you know, you can look for products that are merchant fulfilled from sellers in China that if you FBA, you have an immediate leg up on those sellers. Okay. You can look for products that have bad images, bad copy. So there's, there's lots of opportunity to improve upon a lot of the existing listings in the Amazon catalog as well as new things come out that provide for opportunities. But I'm constantly launching new products. So if there was an opportunity, you know, I wouldn't be launching new products into new categories. And then we've seen, Andy and myself, have seen new products launch this fourth quarter that are already crushing it within a month. So we see firsthand there's opportunities. You know, when I go on and look at pages and pages of like barbecue glove listings, pages and pages of water bottle listings, like water fruit infused water bottle listing. Whenever something gets hot and I look at this and be like, how is a new seller ever going to compete with these guys that just have hundreds and hundreds of reviews? And it's it's kind of intimidating. Yes. So the answer is don't go out and get barbecue gloves <laughs> as a product. <laughs> so you have to find okay. you have to you have to do the product research to find where there are gaps with products on the first page of Amazon for various keywords that aren't going to have a thousand of reviews all surrounding your listing if, yeah. if you get to the first page where people aren't going to buy your product. So yeah, you want to look for the opportunities where you can compete with 20, 30, 40 reviews. And actually, we'll probably get to the question of incentivized reviews. That That's actually a good thing for, for new sellers coming in because you can no longer launch a product and get 500 reviews in your first month or two. So that level of the playing field for people who had deep pockets just throw at incentivized reviews and gives an opportunity to new sellers coming in who will have an easier time competing in those areas that don't have, you know, a thousand reviews for every for every listing on the first page. Okay. Okay. That's a that's a good way to look at it. There's a silver lining to the incentivized review crackdown or product <laughs> product launch process there. Let's dive into some of the product research stuff. So you mentioned, hey, there are listings there are products that aren't on Amazon. There are products where the listing is still not optimized. And there are categories that, you know, maybe are still ripe for some innovation or disruption. So when we talked, Andy, when we talked in 2014, it was, hey, let's go look at this category. Let's go see what's selling there. And we can find this exact same product from the manufacturer and we could bring our own listing to market. What's changed since then? What is your product research process look like at this point as you're looking to enter new markets or launch new products? 
Yeah, so, yeah, it is funny. That was actually, like you said, two years ago that we talked about the uh, onion goggles. And yeah, that definitely, you know, just like you said, like the water bottle infusers, those are products that are easy. Generally, they're going to be new sellers that probably don't do put a lot of work into the research and maybe just want to get their product on quick. And those are the niches that you want to stay away from. Like you said, the silicone barbecue gloves, yeah. you know, there's like 10 listings of those, all the exact same thing. And so you definitely have to do more work uh, up front in making your product unique and not going after those easy products that are highly competitive. And so in the two years since we had our last interview, that has definitely changed. Before there was like safety in knowing what's already selling. So when you say make your product unique, it's like now I'm kind of going into uncharted territory where I don't know that there's demand. Well, not really, right? So you can make your product unique, but still finding what people are looking for. So one of the things that we teach is how to look at what's already selling really, really well and knowing where there's already, you know, Andy always talks about look for places where there's already customer demand, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel. So if there is demand in an area, then I might take something and make it unique by making it a bundle. Let's say I had barbecue gloves. Well, maybe I would make a whole kit that had a barbecue grilling mat, barbecue gloves, meat claws. And you probably have some of that because that's very saturated. But, you know, you try to take a look at things from a from a different perspective to see what what doesn't exist where I can take some things that I know there's customers demand. You know, you can look on Amazon and say Amazon gives you a lot of data. Customers who bought this frequently bought this together. And okay. so you start to you can get a little creative in how you can put some potential products together to make some kind of kit or bundle for that for that customer that that needs to buy that stuff anyway. And still know that yes, there's customer demand for this sort of searches, but how do I use that data but at the same time not make something that everybody else has? The idea is still the same as far as looking at the catalog. It's a matter of making things a little bit different or quantity, colors, sizes, creating more options for people where you can differentiate from every other listing that's going to be around your listing. Do you have an example that we can go through? There was a bundle I was just looking at yesterday and the seller actually ran out of stock. It was the typical silicone gloves. It was the the meat claws, right, mm -hmm. that uh -huh. break up beef. And then he added a tactical flashlight that like goes around your neck. And then he added like a army apron, right? And he came up with the creative marketing, you know, it's basically like man gear or something. And in this box that all the products came in, it was like, di it looked like it was diamond plated, you know, like what folks put on their truck. Okay. And he sold out and it, that price point was very high. It was over $60. His cost on all of that was probably about 20. And so phenomenal margin. He marketed it right. He was a smart marketer. And so each of those individual items, very competitive. You couldn't do it. But then being smart, he put them together and he had a great product. And unfortunately, he didn't make enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sold out. That's a good Christmas gift idea because it's like, yeah, here's here's the kit. Okay, I like that. Aside from doing the bundle thing, can we walk through an example of, am I just going to a certain Amazon category page and seeing what's selling and trying to find inspiration there? Or what's what's that process look like? Yeah, so I brought a product to a bringing product to market right now where it's actually in the, I'll be more general about it. It's actually in the wine space. And everybody had a very, very similar listing. So I knew that there's demand for the product. I also saw that there's, I mean, not a tremendous amount, but probably at least nine, 10 other sellers selling pretty much the exact thing. And then I go to Alibaba and I find the exact pictures that are on Alibaba the sellers are using, which is, which is kind of just being lazy, not having, not taking your own photography. Okay. But then what I did was I went to Pinterest and I put in the search term that holds wine, basically, like a glass that holds wine. Like, like, a, like a wine glass? <laughs> not, not a wine glass, like a bigger sort of like... Like a decanter? So yes. Okay. And basically, I went to Pinterest and I, and I tried to find ideas for what are things out there that maybe aren't on Amazon. And I go to Pinterest, I look at Etsy, find other sites of things that aren't on Amazon or look a little bit differently different than what's the what's there and I ended up creating a bundle with some with some glasses included in it sort of a unique wooden piece to it to hold it and that was just by finding it on Pinterest and sending my supplier a picture and they were able to make a sample and look great and you know it's 
coming to market. But so there's a way to see existing products out there, but then get, even if you're not creative by using the internet to go and get sort of offshoot ideas of how to, how to differentiate a product. And, and yeah, I know there's still a tremendous amount of demand based on the sales rank of the existing products on Amazon and then using tools that can help me find customer search volume. For example, like a tool called Merchant Word that allows you to see customer search volume for specific keywords. So I'm not, it's not uncharted territory where like I'm not inventing new categories or new products where I don't know that there's going to be demand. Okay. The only difference for me is I need to be able to get that product seen by Amazon customers. I need to have an excellent product. I need to have great photos. I need to have a good listing with bullet points and description, good title. And then I need to be able to get it ranked where customers can find it on Amazon and as well as using sponsored ads on Amazon to get visibility for it. That's the big challenge. But if I can find customer demand and I can make something unique that's not there that adds value, then you're starting off on the right foot. Okay, okay. So if I'm understanding correctly, it's like kind of looking at what's already selling and then doing the creative work to figure out what unique spin can I put on that, whether that's bundling it in a different package or presenting it in a different way, like taking inspiration from some of these Pinterest pins or Etsy sellers and stuff like that. With regards to the BSR, like is there a minimum sales rank that you're after or minimum merchant words keyword volume that you're after before something is not interesting to you? I like to see merchant words show at least 10,000 searches a month for an item. And sometimes there'll be different keywords that you can target for that product where combined there may be 50,000 or, or more searches. So I'd like to see at least, at least 10,000. Okay. As far as the sales rank, it kind of depends on the category. Some some categories are smaller than other categories, so it kind of depends. But there's, depending on the category, less than 25,000, some categories less than 10,000. It really depends. And then also when you're going for that, you know, you might find that sweet spot of going for something that's between 10 and 20,000 rank, let's say in home and kitchen, where a lot of other people are looking for products that are like under 1,000 rank and they're super competitive. And yeah. maybe you're going for an area where you might not sell 50 units a day. Maybe you'll sell 10 units a day as a, as a goal, which can still be good if you have a, a few good products like that. So you can also think about going into areas that are maybe a little bit less competitive, products that are heavier, that need to be shipped by boat, that have a little bit of a barrier to entry, that are a little bit more expensive to source. You know, if you think like every other seller, you're going to fall into every other seller's trap of light products that can be shipped by air that costs like three bucks to source. Yeah. But if you think the opposite, then you're eliminating a portion of your competition that just wouldn't source those products. I'll give you a few examples, I think, that might might be helpful. So this year, there was a huge game. I was the number one seller on Amazon. It was called Speak Out. I don't know if you've seen the previews for that at all, Nick. I haven't heard of it. What's it all about? It was a YouTube video. A guy's kind of a YouTube star. And the way it works is they're dental mouth holders. You know, if you go to the dentist, they put those plastic things in your cheek to, to open up your lips, right, to work on. Okay. Well, so they made this funny video where, you know, they, they were four of them. They had these in their mouth. And then they had to say certain words, right? And, and you would have to try to guess what they say. Because when you have those in your mouth, it's really hard, you know, to say like an R word. And the thing just went viral. It went huge. And immediately, like the next day, people were commenting on the video like, man, someone has to make this a game. Well, sure enough, like Hasbro, Mattel, and maybe one other big game manufacturer, right away they jumped on it. Once it got produced it, on Amazon in the toy category, was like number one, two, and three. Even like if you go to the toys right now, it'll it'll be probably a top 10. And so Lee Ron and I, when we saw that right away, we immediately thought about what, what could you make that might go along with that game? And so the little mouth retainers, the dental retainers that come with it, they're just like these generic plastic clear mouthpieces. Well, you know, as we were researching, we found there, there were already sellers who were just selling those now on Amazon, like in packs of 12. So when you buy the game, you get like maybe four or five, right? Okay. Well, smart, smart seller said, well, man, when a family buys this game, they're going to want more of these retainers because it's not like they want to share them, you know? Yeah. And so immediately then like on Amazon, if you search dental mouth openers, now there's a bunch of them. But over the summer, there's only one or two sellers and they were killing it. But what Liran and I said, is, well, you know what they should have done? So what they did is they bundled like 12 together, but they were clear. And so, you know, our thought was, man, how creative would it have been if they would have made like multiple colors? You know, if they would have made 12 various colors, 
So that way, when you're playing the game, you know the blue one is yours. Yeah, no one else is. <laughs> no one else has stuck that in their mouth. Right, but that was just like a very simple product. But you know, sellers got creative. They knew that this game was going to be huge, and the margins on that are phenomenal. And it's funny, we were actually thinking about doing this. Liron was talking to a manufacturer in China, and he's like, the manufacturer's like, man, we don't understand. Like, we're all of a sudden <laughs> selling millions of these, and we have no idea why. <laughs> and, and, like, this is a, on Alibaba, this is like a dental product, you know? Like, yeah. uh, the, the dental industry is booming for some reason, you know? They don't, they don't really understand why. All of a sudden, okay, yeah, I'm on, so I'm on the game, speak out game page on Amazon. And yeah, right underneath, it's customers who bought this item also bought. And right, it's just like listing after listing of these like, oh, 15 pack of these like clear plastic mouth widener things. Yep. Yep. A lot of them. And if you look at them, a lot of them are, are doing really well. And the truth is nobody, I mean, they've been doing so well. They probably haven't had to make them in different colors. But if you wanted to be creative and make your product a little bit unique, then it wouldn't be difficult. I mean, I spoke to the manufacturer it was no problem to get them to make them in different colors or even number them or or do something that's different. But, you know, I do see some sellers making them in different sizes. They come in a few different sizes, depending probably for kids and adults with different small, medium and and large sizes. So some sellers are bundling them and trying Mm -hmm. to make it different probably as it gets more, more competitive. Sometimes you don't have to do that, right? If you're the only one, if if you're competing against two or three other people and it's a very, there's a lot of demand for something, you may not need to get any changes and you could just launch a product, take advantage of a trend, get in and get out. But if you want to have more long-term success with something, it's better to differentiate. Okay. This is something that came up in my chat with Tony Anderson a few months ago, where it was basically, hey, find a hot trend and see what you can do to piggyback on that. And in her case, the hot trend was essential oils. And so she was selling jewelry into the essential oils market. But this is a kind of a similar thing. Like, here's a hot seller. You know it's going to have a lot of visibility on it. And here's a way to get kind of add on to that product. Now, a couple questions that come up. Number one, with like the wine decanter thing, like that sounds like it's going to be glass. That sounds like it's going to be breakable, which goes against some of the advice that I've been given in the past, like in product research, like, hey, you want something that's not glass, it's not going to break. And then on these plastic pieces, some of these listings are selling for not a lot of money, like less than 10 bucks in some cases. And I'm wondering, that was another piece of advice. They look for something that's between like 20 and $50. Right. I'm curious to get your take on on both of those points. Let's look at the first one, right? Kind of like talking about the the reverse psychology, right? A lot of sellers are going to stay away from glass and it's a heavier item. But if you think about probably 90% plus of glass products on Amazon, where do they come from? China. China, right? So if other people are able to do it, then then it's possible. So I did have a conversation with my freight forwarder who handles my shipping, and they suggested to me, for example, in order to, and you know, the factory does know how to properly package it. So I had a conversation with them. They put a special polyfoam around the product. I also, even though I didn't fill a full container, I shipped it in a 20-foot container so that other people's products wouldn't be along with mine, so that it wouldn't have to be loaded and unloaded multiple times. It can just go from the port onto the container, from the container onto a truck okay. without other people's products. So I, I did take some steps to sort of eliminate breakage on it, and I haven't had any issues. But this is going to be one of those things that does scare off people. And for me, that's an advantage. But I know that every product here that we have in this country, for the most part, comes from China that's made of glass, right? So many products. So my thought process was if other people can do it, I could do it as well. And so I decided to import the product. But yeah, a lot of people... When I mentioned, you know, doing glass, they asked me, well, aren't you not supposed to import glass? But again, that's an advantage of doing things that other people wouldn't do. And then, you know, make sure you're taking the right steps to minimize that kind of stuff happening by having that conversation with a supplier, with a shipper, to make sure that you're giving the product the most amount of protection throughout the process. Yeah, I'm looking at the looking at the bottom of my coffee mug here. It says Thailand, so it's not China. But yeah. Thailand, well, yeah. <laughs> Even farther away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and then as far as like products under $10, so generally advice I give as well, look for products that are higher priced, 15, 20, 25, 30. Yeah. The, I have a private label product that's selling for $90 right now. So that's another barrier to entry because that product costs $28 to source. Then when you buy a thousand pieces, $28,000, not something somebody coming in with a few thousand dollars into the marketplace is going to, is going to be able to compete against. So right. that's a benefit. But so I would generally say that's good advice not to target products like under 
in this case with these things, they're so with these, you know, plastic retractors for your mouth, they're so small and so cheap. They're a few pennies a piece that they're still actually they still have actually pretty good margins with these and, and they're selling at such volume that it is a good opportunity with it. But overall I would say that for me this would be like an exception to the rule. Okay. Andy, a couple of years ago you gave us the rule of three. Basically I want to see a three X markup on what I'm paying for the product landed to compare to the sales price. Is that still what you're shooting for on new products in terms of margin? Yeah, I mean that's pretty much it. If you're if you're buying it from ten, you want to be able to sell it for thirty or more. It really is. It's the old adage, right? Buy low, sell high. Yep. And when you do it on Amazon, you want to try to have a three time ratio. Now, the only caveat to that is if you have something that is like amazing sales velocity, you know, it's the old slow dime or a fast nickel. And if you have something that is just like a thousand rank and you're just blowing them out then it's okay maybe to make 4 or $5 per unit on. But generally, if you're going to get into importing, you want to be doing it where you're buying it for, for 10 and selling it for 30, or three times what yeah. you buy it for. Okay. Especially with a more competitive landscape, you might need to use sponsored ads on Amazon. It's something that more, more people are using. So bids are going up. You can't get reviews fast in easy way. So you need to get more visibility to your products through ads. So you need to sort of, you need to have some margin in there so that you can have the budget to do ads and get visibility to your product. Okay. Yeah, maybe let's we can dive into the ad stuff that adds to your initial expense. People are like, well, now I've got to order this product, ship it across the world, and now I'm going to spend extra money to get reviews and to get some eyeballs to it. You guys have seen from your students, what's a realistic startup cost for, for somebody getting in and then... Do they? Do you have like a a desired break even? And maybe for your own products, hey, I want to break even on this after three months, five months, one month. Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so it's actually interesting. I, I've had students that have actually purchased product for three hundred dollars. And uh, Alibaba, AliExpress, they're actually making it a lot easier, almost like Amazon now, where where you can actually add it to the cart, pay with your credit card, and get a small initial order. You know, it used to be where you had to like give a, a very high MOQ. It's not like that anymore. On AliExpress? Yeah, and Alibaba actually. Okay. So on Alibaba now, they have a lot of the manufacturers have add to cart buttons and you can order a product. And it's really a good way too to test. If you're thinking about something and you're not sure about it, to be able to purchase 40 or 50 units, create a good listing, put it up on Amazon, see how it does. But no no like branding or modifications on those. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to do that right away. Now, if it's a product that you are confident in, then we suggest that you do that. But if it's something that you're just kind of testing, you can get in for three or $400. There was a product that I actually did. They were barbell collars. So CrossFit, you know, it's a big trend, a big movement. When I was working out at the gym, I saw all the coaches had these like awesome aluminum barbell collars, right? Sorry, I have no idea. What, could you describe what that is? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, when you're lifting weights, you put these collars on to keep the weights on the bar. And a lot of times they're just bracket type things you slide on. Well, these these were like really fancy aluminum ones that clipped on super easy. And I knew right away that people that do CrossFit, they're going to want these. And so I looked on Amazon at the time, there was only like one or two sellers. And I was able to buy 50 of those for $500 on Alibaba, put my credit card in, made the order, okay. and, uh, and was able to throw those right up and they sold right away. And so you are able to do that as well if you don't have a lot of capital. Okay, interesting. I would say, you know, if you're starting out and you are looking for a product that you're going to brand and launch on Amazon, you're probably looking at it least twenty five hundred to four thousand dollars in terms of being able to source a product, get it here, and then also have some units that you can do some giveaways and get some initial sales to get it to get some initial sales velocity to get some traction on Amazon as well as some sponsored ad for the product. So I mean as far as a product that you're gonna launch and brand. Okay. So what's next? So it's something I find something, I you know put my unique spin on it. I love it using those creative muscles. And then Liron, maybe tell me a little bit about that launch process. You've alluded to it a couple of times with the Amazon sponsored ads. Is that something that makes sense to spend money on right, of the, right out of the gate when I don't have any reviews or do I have to go after reviews first? So in the past, I would definitely not turn on sponsored ad until I had some reviews. 
now the game's a little bit different because you can't just give away products in exchange for reviews. So it's a little bit harder to get reviews. But essentially, the first step to understanding what a launch looks like is getting insight or understanding to Amazon A9 search algorithm, right? And the question is, what does Amazon want? Amazon wants people who are going to search for something. They're going to be a shopper and they're going to turn into a customer. So what is Amazon going to put in front of people searching for certain keywords? They're going to, they're going to put things that have already converted for those keywords, right? So it's like a catch-22. If you don't have sales, how are you going to be put in front of customers to get the sales? Right. Because Amazon wants to, to maximize that. And as soon as you start getting conversion on your product, then Amazon's going to start to, to rank you. So that means when you are launching your product into the marketplace, you need to be able to get it into people's hands to find the product on Amazon, buy it. One way to do that, very simple way of friends and family. Ask your friends to go to Amazon, search for my product. So just as a tip, the best way to send Amazon those signals is to do what's called a search, find, and buy. So my product may be on page 10 for the keyword barbecue gloves, but I'm going to tell my friends and family, go do a search for barbecue gloves, find my product on page 10, click on it and buy, right? What that does is it tells the Amazon algorithm, this keyword is very much related to this product, right? And then you start seeing some movement with that. And then there's some services out there that will help you do that, do some product giveaways. There's various websites and services that will help you do that to reach sort of a bigger audience other than friends and family to help you launch and, and rank your product. Okay. So the big like services that were like, hey, give away 50 units, 100 units and get some reviews, not as effective anymore, just like straight not allowed anymore. But like this more manual outreach is the way to go. Well, the manual outreach is a great way to start the process. And, and what's happened to those big services who could no longer say to customers, for example, there are services out there that what happened was you would set up your product there. A customer would come in, buy the product at a discount, and then that customer would not be able to get like another deal from that site unless they left a review. So they were forced really into leaving reviews. Oh, okay. That's no longer allowed. So what's happened is those services have changed their model just being sort of like deal sites, right? Where customers can come in, buy a product at a discount, and they don't have to leave a review. They can. You can still have a follow-up email sequence through Amazon's messaging system okay. to request a review. You just can't give them the product in exchange for review. And like straight require review. Okay. Exactly. Straight require. So you can still do giveaways and those sites have kind of changed your model a little bit, but it can still be effective in terms of launching a product. There's other people that have some more advanced strategies who set up their own landing pages and drive traffic to those landing pages from Facebook or from other sources. And from there, they send customers coupon code or they build a list to where they, they're able to send customers coupon codes and links to their products. They're kind of building their own list for current launches and future launches, which is also a smart thing to do, but a little bit more advanced for somebody just starting up. But essentially, that you still need an initial sales velocity to get some organic visibility. So this is an interesting hack. So instead of sending people like the link direct to your product, you're sending them a link to Amazon with the instructions like search for the specific keyword I want to rank for. Here's the name of my shop or it'll say like sold by such and such and fulfilled by Amazon. Scroll through the listings until you find that one, buy that one. And then so that sends the signal like, hey, I should rank. It's the number one best way to rank products for a specific keyword. Okay. Interesting. It's crazy. Like when we talk about launching it, if you do your work in the research part, there are still thousands of products that even, you know, like I just actually launched a product a week ago. I just threw it up on Amazon and I'm already selling 10 units a day. Didn't do any giveaways. Didn't call my family or friends to look at it. And so it just blows me away. The marketplace, I think, is just continuing to grow. And I think I shared this in our first interview when we talked two years ago. So I did 400,000, right, my first year full time. Last year, I did 900,000. And then this year, which will be like my third full time year, I'll do 1.8 million. And that's just incredible growth. And I tell you, I'll be honest, Nick, it's not because like I'm a genius business guy or because I'm creative in launching product or finding product. It really has everything to do with the amazing power of the Amazon marketplace. Well, you've got an eye. Like, don't discount yourself. Like, you've got an eye for this stuff. Like, to go to the CrossFit gym and say, like, hey, I know I can sell those. Like, that's a skill. Yes. Yeah. But no, I'll, I'll agree with you on the power of the marketplace as well. Like, hey, go where the cash is already flowing, right? And Amazon, there's definitely a lot of cash flowing through there. If you can put your, like I like to say, put your buy buttons up there, make it easy for people to do business with you. <laughs> 
Right, right. Anything else on the product launch front that we should know about? I would add that when you, I mentioned before, but when you launch a product, your photography and your title, really, really important. Don't skimp out on the, especially in the area of photography. You really have about 10 seconds as customers are scrolling through, you know, on their phone or iPads or laptops on products. And if you have bad photography, you're starting off on a really, really, your product's going to fail, basically. Yeah. So don't just use the default Alibaba pictures. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or take bad pictures with your iPhone. There's photographers that aren't expensive that charge like 20 bucks an image. You could do much better. So photography take, is very important. Don't take a picture of your product like on your bed sheet. <laughs> We've seen that. <laughs> okay. Well, so this is kind of good stuff to hear because it's like, well, there's still some of that out there. And like you said, it's like doing what the next seller either isn't thinking about or isn't willing to do. And that, that turns into a competitive advantage. So I'm very blessed to have a professional photographer in the house with me. So if I <laughs> go down this path, I can get some good product images going that way. This has been fascinating, guys. So I want to thank you guys for taking the time to come on and share some of these different product sourcing, product launching, Amazon hacks and, and tricks. If you guys want to learn more about the Amazon business, I encourage you to check out their site, amazingfreedom.com. And if you hit up amazingfreedom.com slash hustle, there's what's over there, guys, a free video series on how to how to get started. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you'll see that we have a video series that actually will walk you through. We call it the five phases of how you source product, how you launch product, and then how you get your product ranked on Amazon. Very good. Well, that sounds like the important stuff that you need to know. Amazingfreedom.com slash hustle. Thank you again for joining me. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. We'll do Liron first. Sure. So this is a great time to think about what do you want out of 2017? My belief is that when you ask questions, you get answers. And so ask yourself, what do you want for 2017? Write it down and then make a plan to on the first of every month for the coming year to sort of sit down and say, well, you know, what do I want out of this month? Write down the, your goals. And I think it's a very, very powerful thing that you can do, especially starting at the new year. Just quick study, people who made a New Year's resolution, those that didn't write down their goals, they look back at a group of people and only 4% actually followed through with the resolution. Those that wrote down what their resolution was, 44% followed up with it. So just the act of writing down what you want for, for the coming year is very, very powerful. I think everyone listening is like, I know what I want. I want that 400K in, in sales in year one, just like you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would say, I mean, I highly encourage you, if you're not already, to get into what we're talking about, physical product business. What I love about selling physical products is, for the most part, and I see this with members in my course, if you pick the right product with good margin, the worst case scenario is usually you're going to break even or maybe lose maybe a dollar a unit. Because if you've done really good with your research and you have a physical product, you can always drop the price and sell it. And so I just think it's an amazing platform. I always, you know, uh, Liran and I, we could talk about Amazon forever. <laughs> and I just think there's huge opportunity out there. So, yeah, my tip is definitely look into getting into physical product business. Sounds good, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. And we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. All right, my top takeaways from this call with Andy and Liron. Number one, there's still opportunity in the marketplace. As crowded as it may seem, creative sellers are still finding unique angles and profitable products. I was surprised to hear how often that creative muscle kind of came up during this call on how to find a unique a unique angle, a unique take on what's already moving. Takeaway number two was to zig where others zag. Now, what I'm hearing from Andy and Liron is to do what other beginner sellers aren't doing, whether that's targeting a higher price point or importing glass items like we talked about. That seems to be a common thread in this conversation as well. Takeaway number three was you got to spend money to make money. Like Andy said, it's the same buy low, sell high business model that's been around for ages, but that still involves buying up front. So I encourage you to start small. Don't make a bet you can't afford to lose and scale up as you start to see some results. These guys, of course, are putting up big numbers, but they've also been at it for years. So take that into consideration. 
To download the free PDF highlight reel with all of Andy and Leron's top tips from this conversation, please visit SideHustleNation.com slash Andy. And for even more private labeling goodness, including the free video training series that Andy mentioned, check out AmazingFreedom.com slash Hustle. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show, the first edition of 2017, where you're going to hear from a mom with a pretty awesome side hustle in the health and fitness space. I'll see you then. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 